Welcome to Manifested Publishers. Hello learners, my name is Stephen Kariungi. Welcome to today's biology lesson. Our topic of discussion is sexual reproduction in plants. And today we are continuing our study on pollination. So today we are going to look at the second agent of pollination, and that is wind. So we are going to look at adaptations of wind pollinated flowers. And these wind pollinated flowers are also known as anemophilus. flowers. So in this case, uh, we are saying that uh, uh, these flowers have special adaptations uh, that enable wind to be an agent, to be an effective agent of pollination. Now, one of the adaptations is that these flowers are small in size whereby petals may be or may not be absent. There are flowers that are very inconspicuous. You cannot easily notice them. And these are the flowers, for example, that we find in the grass family. Yeah? If you look at uh, uh, the flowers in grass, they are very, very small. Their petals are very small and very inconspicuous you cannot easily notice them. So we are saying that uh, flowers are small with small and inconspicuous petals or bracts or inflorescence. So these flowers may exist, some as petals, some as bracts, some as inflorescence that are small and inconspicuous. So they are not very easy to identify. Now, another feature uh, is that the, since these flowers do not need to attract the wind, because the wind will just come about, they have no nectar and are not scented. They are not scented. And therefore, they do not need to attract the agent of pollination. which in this case is wind. The other characteristic or the other adaptation is in their anthers. Their anthers are large. And loosely attached to a flexible filament. They are large and loosely attached to a flexible filament to allow them to be swayed. Swayed by wind. So their anthers are large, loosely attached to a flexible filament so that they are easily swayed by the wind so that uh, the wind can collect the pollen grains. So it by the wind to collect pollen. How are the pollen grains themselves? The pollen grains are small
they are small, light, and many. To allow them float in air during transportation. To allow them to float in air during transportation. That's why they need to be very light, very small, and many, because some of them will be lost along the way. The stigma is also large. feathery or sticky to collect pollen grains to collect pollen grains floating in the air so they are stigma are large they are feathery or some of them are sticky so that once the pollen grains touch them or get into contact with them, they will just stick so that now pollination will be enhanced. So basically those are some of the adaptations that are commonly found in wind pollinated flowers, also known as anemophilous flowers. The other thing that we are going to learn are the features and mechanisms that hinder self-pollination and self-fertilization. The features and mechanisms that hinder self-pollination and self-fertilization. So what happens here, there are some features that exist naturally to ensure that self-pollination does not take place. And if self-pollination does not take place, then self-fertilization cannot take place. Which are these features? Now, one of those features are the hermaphrodites. And monoecious plants hermaphrodites are those flowers that have both sexes and monoecious plants are those plants that have flowers having both sexes so these hermaphrodites and the monoecious plants are they have some natural features such as the scent, bright color, large petals, conspicuous petals. So those natural features ensure that self-pollination does not take place because they encourage cross-pollination. They encourage insects to come and act as an agent of pollination. So in other words, we are saying that they encourage cross-pollination. So we are saying that uh, they have features such as brightly colored petals, and conspicuous Petals. They are scented to attract insects and hence encourage cross pollination. So we are saying that those features 
they encourage cross pollination at the expense at the expense of self pollination so in the process they hinder self pollination so the fact that they are able to attract insects by their brightly colored petals conspicuous petals and their scent and also even the nectar you'll find that uh, they will encourage more cross pollination than self pollination number 2 is what we call self sterility or incompatibility self sterility or incompatibility this is whereby when the pollen grains land on the stigma within the same plant they cannot germinate pollen tubes they cannot germinate pollen tubes because they are similar they are genetically identical to the other parts of that plant so they are generally incompatible with the stigma of the same plant and therefore they will not germinate pollen tubes and therefore there will be no self pollination so self sterility we are saying that uh, pollen grains are sterile ie cannot germinate pollen tubes on the stigma of the same plant so these discourages this discourages uh, self pollination and encourages cross pollination So, basically what we have uh, learned today, we have learned the adaptations of wind pollinated flowers, what we also known as, uh, what we also refer to as anemophilous flowers. The adaptations are, their flowers are small, very small and inconspicuous petals or bracts or inflorescence. They have no nectar and also are not scented because they don't need to attract anything as an agent of pollination. The wind is usually there most of the time. Their anthers are large and loosely packed or loosely attached to a flexible filament, a filament that is very flexible to allow them to be swayed by the wind so that the wind can be able to obtain the pollen the pollen grains themselves are light very light they are small in size they are many so that they can float in the air during transportation the stigma is large feathery or sticky so that the pollen grains can stick those pollen grains that are floating in the air once they come into contact with the stigma they will just come uh, they will just uh, uh, attract they will just get attracted you can also mention here that uh, also uh, that the stigma hangs outside the petals of course that is to also encourage the collection of a pollen We've also learned about the features and mechanisms that hinder self-pollination and self-fertilization. The factors that ensure that self-pollination and self-fertilization does not take place. We've seen hermaphrodites and monoecious plants. 
And these ones, they have special features that encourage cross-pollination. Brightly colored and conspicuous petals, the fact that they have nectar and they are scented encourages cross-pollination. Number two, we've seen self-sterility or incompatibility, whereby the pollen grains are sterile to the stigma of the same plant, and therefore it cannot germinate the pollen tubes. So we are going to stop there, and uh, we'll have a short assignment on what we have learned. So the assignment for today, the first question, state and explain five adaptations of wind-pollinated flowers. Number two, state and explain two features that hinder self-pollination and self-fertilization. So we're going to meet next time. Goodbye.